Um, we're going to talk about integrative immune oncology and uh, the importance of understanding how to modulate the immune system, not just for managing cancer, but managing uh, any chronic disease out there, uh, whether it's autoimmune, infection, degenerative, um, they do have immune imbalance and we need to restore that balance or modulate it in a way we can um, effectively destroy the infection and cancers. Um, so I know the old school that when we are studying autoimmune diseases, um, we are thinking more about, okay, it's all about um, looking to differentiate and come up with a diagnosis. Let's say if we have autoimmune diseases, we need to know uh, what kind of autoimmune, let's say it's, you have uh, autoimmune diseases that are affecting the joint. We need to know whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, uh, could be psoriatic arthritis. So we start looking for all those factors like rheumatoid factors, anti-Smith, anti-nuclear antibodies. Um, for, for, for the modern medicine, um, it's good to have those factors and knowing the diagnosis, but is that going to help you in managing the disease? Yeah, it gives you some sort of defining what is the disease is, and then you, you go ahead and follow the protocols of the big pharma, but most of those treatment is the same thing. It's, it's steroids and all the cytotoxic drugs that suppress the immune system. So there's not much of difference in managing systemic lupus uh, from managing uh, asthma, from managing rheumatoid arthritis. They, they use um, immune suppression and that suppress the immune system. I think the modern medicine, it's now different. When we manage autoimmune diseases, we need to know whether this autoimmune is TH1 dominant, TH2 dominant, TH17 dominant, and then modulate the immune system by shifting it Either way. So if you have allergies, you would have too much of TH2 over activities, then you wanna shift it to TH1. If you have autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, they do have both TH17 and TH1 dominant. So you wanna shift it to TH2 or TH reg. And, and that's where you apply all this new modern medicine, especially those repurposing drugs or those antibodies which will help to modulate the immune system in a state of suppressing uh, the whole immune system and put the patient at risk of having infection and cancer. Um, we're gonna focus more on um, integrative immune oncology, understanding how the immune system is destroying the cancer and how your cancer is evading or how the patient's cancer is evading the immune system and how we can overcome the escape of the immune uh, system attack of the cancer because that would help us to really manage cancer more effectively. But before going there, we really need to know how your immune system works. Um, I think the modern medicine modern immune therapy or modern immunology is a little bit different from the old school. Now it's all about understanding that the macrophages determines the polarization of the immune system. And what determine the macrophages type of polarization is what they eat. Um, so let's say if the macrophages or the antigen presenting cells or the dendritic cells, they eat I have a conference now. Um, if the macrophages, um, they eat bacteria, then the macrophages, antigen-presenting antigen cells, um, polarize into M17. If it's dendritic cells, dendritic cell 17, and they start polarizing the naive T cells into TS17, and they start secreting interleukin-17 and transforming growth factor uh, beta. 
if the macrophages or antigen presenting cells or dendritic cells aid cancer or aid um, inf virally infected cells. Um, then what happened to those macrophages, they polarize into M1 and then they start secreting inter interferon gamma uh, and interleukin 2, um, and which will cause the naive T cells to polarize into Th1, and then Th1 will start secreting interleukin 12, but that, that will lead to that positive feedback of polarizing the immune system into M1, Th1, and that will activate the cytotoxic T cells, the naive T cytotoxic T cells, and become active. And then the cytotoxic T cells are responsible to attack and destroy those cancer cells and those virally infected cells. So, uh, so that's how your uh, immune system is, 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 is polarizing into a certain direction. And that will lead to destruction of the pathogens or the cancer. Let's say if the macrophages ate um, pieces of the parasites like a worm uh, or pollens, then the macrophages polarize into M2 and they start secreting into leukin 4 and then into leukin 4 will polarize the naive T cells of TH2 and they start secreting antibodies, which is immuno, mostly they are going to be immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin E and they will opsonize those parasites and then the new, and, and what, what they will do, they will be activating the central leukin 4, they will activate isinophil and basophils and, and those basophil and isinophils, they will attack uh, those parasites after they've been optionized by immunoglobulin E. Um, and so you will see also the activation of the histamines and release of the histamine of mast cells and releasing of histamine. That's all activated by um, the cytokine that's being released from the Th2, M2, uh, especially the interleukin 4. Um, and so the polarization of the immune system also gives you an understanding why uh, you would have neutrophilia. In neutrophilia, it's because of activation of the Th17, M17, and that neutrophil whole purpose of it is to kill the bacteria, right? The bacteria will be opsonized by the immunoglobulins and the neutrophils will gonna attack them. So those polarization of the immune system determine also the uh, white blood cells differential um, and the percentage of the, of the neutrophil versus lymphocytes versus uh, isinophil and basophil. So when you have TF17, M17, you will have neutrophil neutrophilia. When you have an active M2, TH2, then you will have isinophil and basophil high. And if you have cancer, you will see lymphocytosis. You, and, and, and viral infection, you will see lymphocytosis. So the polarization of the immune system also um, affects the polarization of the uh, native immune system, which is the WBC and differentiate it based on the polarization of the of the Th1 uh, of the of the of the T cells and and the M cells, the macrophages and T cells. So they affect the WBC differential counts. Um, what about macrophages if they eat the self antigens? Then what will happen? They will polarize into M, M, uh, M regs. MREGs will start secreting uh, interleukin 10, transforming growth factor beta, which will polarize the naive T cells into Tregs. And of course, the Tregs, interleukin 10, will cause the suppression of the immune system, especially those effector cells, effector T cells, and, and what gives you what we call tolerance. So now we understand how the immune system operates how it's being polarized and it's all about what the macrophage eats and then how that will also affect the uh, WBC differential. That's why I all the time ask the patients to, or we ask them to do WB differential because I can, from the differential, I can predict what polarization of the immune system is. If they have too much of neutrophil, that's mean they, have, they are T at 17, M17. And that's what's happened to um, when we are affected by COVID-19. 
as a virus. We're supposed to have the polarization to be TH1M1, but what happened in this virus is hijacked or is hijacking the RAS system. And when you hijack the RAS system, it leads to polarization to wrong direction, which is uh, TH17M17, and it's fooling the whole um, immune system. And you will have neutrophilia. Of course, neutrophilia will not do anything to the virus. What you need, you need the polarization to TH1M1. That's what you need to kill the virus. But this virus is hijacking the virus system um, and it's uh, blocking the antioxidant arm of the RAS system, allowing the and uh, allowing uh, unchecked uh, inflammatory arm of RAS system, which is the angiotensin II type one receptor signaling. And that leads to polarization of the immune system to TH17, M17, which is the wrong direction as we are being infected by the bacteria. So this is how the COVID-19 is fooling the whole immune system and it's causing the immune system to be polarized in the wrong direction and it caused the virus to flourish. And that's why COVID-19 is a dangerous virus. That's not happening when you have a common cold virus. When you have a common cold virus, polarization is to M1, TH1, cytotoxic T cells, and cytotoxic T cells kills those infected cells. So if you wanna manage COVID-19, you start giving all those drugs that polarize the immune system to TH1 and 1. So you start giving them Lozertan, Methylam Blue, um, Ivermectin, all of this helps to inhibit the TH17 and it helps to polarize the immune system to M1, TH1, thymosin alpha. Um, this will help to polarize the immune system from TH17 to TH1, M1, and this will help to destroy the virus. Um, okay, so what about cancer? Do the cancer fool the immune system the same like COVID-19? Yes. Cancer also, normally when, you, when the macrophages eat the cancer, antigen, um, it's supposed to polarize to M1, TH1, and then you have cytotoxic T cells, and cytotoxic T cells attack the cancer cells, release paraphorines, and open closing holes into the cancer cells and blow them up. That's the normal um, way that we kill the cancer. But the cancer is so smart, they start secreting chemicals that will polarize the immune system away from TH1 and 1. They start secreting interleukin 10, transforming growth factor beta. And think about it, interleukin 6. So think about if you have a macrophages and it's eating the cancer and the cancer is secreting interleukin 10, what would happen to this macrophages? In a state of being polarized into M1, polarized immune system and the TH naive into TH1, then TH1, M1 will polarize the naive uh, cytotoxic T cells and into, um, into cytotoxic active T cells and kill the cancer, they start moving in the wrong direction. They move into T regs, M regs. Of course, if you T regs, M regs, that's mean you are causing tolerance to the, to the tumor. And the tumor evades the immune system and start proliferating, and differentiating and the immune system is considering it as its self antigen because they're secreting interleukin 10, which polarized the immune system into T regs, and T regs inhabit the immune system, inhabit all the effector uh, cells, include it inhabit the TH1, it inhabit the TH17. So there's no way for uh, destroying the cancer if, if this happened. And that's what's happening to most of the cancers. Or some of those cancer cells, they start secreting interleukin 6, transforming growth factor beta, and those macrophages will turn into. M17, TH17, and they, they, they ask they will have neutrophilia, yes, but that's not what we want. We want cytotoxic T cells. We want M1, TH1, but that's how the immune system is, is fooling, or that's how the cancer is fooling the immune system, is polarizing it away from M1, TH1. And of course, when you have too much of TH17, M17, and you have too much of interleukin-6, then you you stimulate the fibroblasts, you will have fibrosis. And what the fibrosis does in the cancer? Oh, that's a big problem. That's what's the problem that I have experienced with my dad when he has hyperpharyngeal carcinoma. And yes, you do chemotherapy, you do photodynamic therapy, but the problem is the fibrosis. And I think that's the missing link, which I did not really 
understand it at that time, I wish if I did, I'll be able to really manage cancer more effectively. And what does the fibrosis does in the cancer when you have fibrosis due to overproduction of interleukin 6, transforming growth factor beta, malpolarization of the immune system to TH17, uh, M17. Uh, the fibrosis really, what it does, it does um, cause the cancer to be hiding. It, uh, it squeezes the blood vessels. Just think about it, when you have too much of fibrosis and you squeeze the blood vessels, then you cannot get those cytotoxic T cells infiltrating the cancer. So it's protecting the cancer. Um, that's one way of, of uh, of, of those fibrotic tissue do, do, works. It, it squeezes the blood vessels, preventing the toxic C cells from entering into the cancer. So they will be wrapped around those fibrotic tissues and they will evade the immune system because there's no, those blood vessels are being squeezed by the fibrotic tissues. And so when we manage cancer, we need to destroy those fibrotic tissues, whether you use shockwave, you use losartan, um, you use collagenase, it's very important. Um, what are the things that the cancer does? Um, they also secrete what we call the VGF, vascular and endothelial growth factors. And high amount of VGF causes the blood vessels become kinky, torches and kinky. Uh, yes, dilated, yes, leaky, but kinky, which means that they can be easily squeezed by the tumor mass. And think about it, when you have those blood vessels being squeezed, shut down, then you would have a hard time to get those infiltrating T cells to go into the cancer. What also uh, happened is that when you squeeze those blood vessels by the fibrotic tissues and, and also because of blood vessels, because mm -hmm. vascular and endothelial, factor is, is, is causing those blood vessels to become kinky and leaky, but easily to be squeezed, then you would have hypoxia, right? And hypoxia is, uh, is, is really favor environment for the cancer. Cancer do like hypoxia because hypoxia shuts down the mitochondria and moves the whole thing into glycolysis. And that's the favorite thing for, um, for the cancer. Why? Um, because you don't want, and the cancer does not want mitochondria to be active because the mitochondria, if it's being active and it has enough of oxygen, it will generate a burst of free radical that will stimulate apoptosis and kill the cancer. So the shifting from aerobic to metabolic uh, to anaerobic, it's, very, it's good for the cancer. Um, and, and going through glycolysis because they don't want the mitochondria to be active because mitochondria, we call mitophagy process. If it's being active, it can kill the cancer. So the cancer is doing everything to um, evade the immune system. Um, not just that, the acidosis, it's, it's an environment that modulates the immune system into T-Rex. So acidosis, along with vascular uh, v VGF and vascular endothelial growth factors, they polarize the immune system into um, AMREG, THREG. So that's another way of evading the immune system by causing tolerance to the cancer. Not just that, acidosis also uh, turns those adult cancer cells into um, into stem cells, into cancer stem cells. It did de differentiate adult, adult cancer cells into um, cancer stem cells. And cancer stem cells are very hard to get rid of uh, because they have a very powerful antioxidant capacity that can neutralize all those bursts of free radicals. Um, so that's another way that cancer, how it's uh, evading the immune system and, 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 and resisting chemotherapies uh, by de-differentiating de into, um, de into, into backward, into cancer stem cells. 
so knowing all those factors, um, knowing all this, we call tumor microenvironments that, that favor the cancer. And that's the new field of, of, of medicine. That's a new field of immune oncology, integrative immune oncology is to, you know, before we focusing on how to blow up cancers by giving, by doing the photodynamic therapy, feeding those cancer photosensitizers, shine light, activate free radicals and induce apoptosis or giving them metabolites that will interfere and block those DNA replications or folic acids, we block that as well. Um, that's, that's the old school of chemotherapy. Now, we, we need also to focus on changing the microenvironment of the cancer, tumor microenvironment. So it's not enough just to blow up cancer cells, but also you need to consider also thinking about changing the tumor microenvironment and how to polarize the immune system back into TH1 and 1. And so that's where you, we have a comprehensive integrative immune oncologies uh, protocols that, that yes, we need to blow up the cancer cells using chemotherapy for the sensitizers, radiotherapy, but also we need to change the tumor microenvironments. We need to destroy the fibrotic tissues using maybe collagenase, low zertan, shock waves. We need to block the VGF using, uh, using antibodies that blocks the VGF. Um, and I think uh, Dr. Patel is using it currently. Um, it's called Avastin, one of those drugs that blocks the VGF. Um, not just that, the tumor cells also express what we call the PDL1. And how the PDL1 works, um, the, the PDL1 works by switching off the cytotoxic T cells when they're trying to attack those cancers. The cytotoxic T cells, when they attack the cancer, they have a receptors called um, T, uh, T cell receptors, and they attach to the major histocompatibility complex that's, that has the, the antigen. But on both sides of this T cell receptors, there is co-stimulatory ligands and co-inhibitory ligands. Um, it's like a paddles break and, uh, and a gas paddle. And what it does uh, when the tumors express the PDL1, it actually push on the uh, break battle of the PDL1, uh, the PDL, PD, PD1 of the, of the T cells and, and switch them off. And we're gonna see that in the beautiful animations that's coming up right now. I'm gonna play this video. Once you watch this video, uh, I know what I'm presenting. It's um, kind of takes time to process and you need more animations and more visual. Um, and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play a video. Once you watch those videos, you will understand, you know, you will be able to process and picture and, and uh, have better understanding of, of all these uh, things that we just talked about. So let's just go ahead with the video and watch this. So it gives you better visualization of what we are talking about. Um, let's see. Okay. Let me know if you can hear the video. Can you hear the video? Just barely. Our immune system is built. Yes. Can you hear the video? Not, not very loud. Okay. You're not going to play video here? Yeah, we can't hear it. It's yeah, really did you low. hear the video? No, it's low, very low. And it's not playing video. You cannot hear it? No. 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 We cannot see it or we cannot okay. hear it. Barely. You cannot hear you barely hear the video. Okay. That's a problem. 
Okay. Because we need this video to be heard. Um, is it because my connection is weak? Today's date is Tuesday, June. Okay. If if what I will do is that, um, I will just uh, post. 2015. The title for today's. Let me see. Can you hear this video? Can you hear anything? Possible through the generous support of Andrew. No. Okay. You cannot hear the video. Okay. I what I will do, I will hear it, but it's static. Right. So what I will do, I will uh, copy, paste it, put it in the room, and then I will have um, Dr. William to go ahead and play it in his side because maybe my internet connection is weak. Uh, so that's one way we can do it. So let's do this. Uh, let me send you a, a link to everybody. Okay, so Dr. William, can you go ahead and play that video from your side? Share your screen. I will take my screen out. Um, let's see. I'm taking my screen off and then you do it from your side. There is Did you see the chat room? Can you play that video in your in your side? Yeah. Make sure when you share, you click on the voice so we can hear. There's like when you share, there's a little square that you need to check it. Ring. No, I don't see it. I don't see it. When you share the screen, it should show. Be, you. William, there's a little two squares. That you need to click on the I see screen. little square thing so you can get the voice going. I, hit the, I, I did hit those, but I don't. Okay, now go to the chat room and click on that chat room. Okay. Chat room, there's a link there. Click on it. Chat room. Can you see the, the chat room? No. <laughs> chat, okay. Here. Oh, you don't yeah, there's a link there. Click on it. I'm stopped. Stop share. There's a link. Got it. Now Did I got you. See you. The link? No, now I Did see you. See you. I see the link. Okay, click on that link. Got it. Okay, see the video? The video is coming up on my. Uh... My, my, my. Okay. And then you share your screen, but when you share your screen, you need to make sure you you include a voice. Got that. Which is little square that you need to check on. Okay. So that's mean you're good. It's not coming up. Um, did you share your screen? Yeah, it's I don't see your video screen. thumbnails are minimized. It's still spinning. Oh, here we go. Uh, it will come up. It will come up. Very important that I don't see your screen. Start sharing your screen, William. You see, yes. Oh, God, go back yeah. and go to the one up above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're seeing the screen. It's good moving. That's good. That's good. We're seeing the video. It's just takes time, but it's going to play. So your connection is weak, too? No, uh, this isn't the best computer. Oh, uh -huh, I see. Okay. Anybody has a good computer, fast one, if this doesn't work? and understand computer. But this video will give us a better understanding of what I'm talking about. You just watch it today. Why don't you share screen with me and let me try it? Okay, I just gave it to you. You are 
You want to go well, ahead? Let you me do try it? because I have a new computer. So if it works. Okay, it will work. Just go ahead and click that video. You can you see I the video? I can see the video, but. Uh, what about the voice? No, there's no, there's no voice. Oh. No, I'm just saying you watch the video. You, you can watch it. The video, okay. the link, I give it to yeah, you. But... So go ahead, share the screen. Share your screen. You already have the co-host. Okay. No, did I give you the co-host? No. Let me see. I did not give you the co-host. Okay, you are co-host here. Okay, can you share the video now? Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. So play the video. All right. Not, not, not your presentation, the video. Oh, I know, I know. Uh, it's a... Uh... When you share, when you put your share, make sure you click on the voice when you do the share. Did you do that? And then share your screen. Oh, let me just see. Uh, okay. Video where I don't. Okay, let me go in chat room and see, and and open this. But, yeah. Okay. okay. Let me see if, if it works that way. Yeah, it's coming. Okay, but I need you to share this your screen so we can see it ourselves because what I'm seeing here it's your our USB driver. Equipped with cells that form an army that help our body okay. defend itself and fight foreign invaders. Can you see it, guys? No. We hear the voice. That's good, but your screen. Hello. Cells you need to lower that. B cells are programmed to get rid of foreign invaders like viruses and bacteria. Can you lower what you see in front of you? I'm sorry, what? And B you cells need to share your screen. Visualize them. I sharing the we screen. But well, what we're seeing right now, we're seeing your USB driver. Foreign invaders and attack them by secreting okay. special factors or weapons. How can our immune cells do this? So close the sharing again. Close the sharing. Cells. How about now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. okay. Start from the beginning. Like worker bees and are responsible and for the function and of make it full screen. Beautiful. Okay. These proteins yeah, break I, into small parts that. called peptides. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. beautiful. Okay, let's start from the beginning. Okay, you can start it. Good, beautiful. And you can do full screen. Our immune system is equipped with cells that form an army that help our body defend itself and fight foreign invaders. Some of these immune cells, called T cells and B cells, are programmed to get rid of foreign invaders like viruses and bacteria. T cells release toxins against the foreign invaders, and B cells make antibodies to neutralize them. We have known for some time that our immune cells can recognize cancer cells as foreign invaders and attack them by secreting special factors or weapons. How can our immune cells do this? The organs of our body are composed of billions of cells. These cells contain thousands of proteins that act like worker bees and are responsible for the function of our cells. These proteins break into small parts called peptides. Some of these travel to the surface of our cells and are presented by molecules called MHC or HLA. T cells continuously scan the surface of these cells through the T cell receptor or TCR. The TCR works as a barcode scanning machine and the peptides presented on the cells are unique barcodes. This function of the T cells is called surveillance. If T cells recognize these peptides as normal, then the T cells move on. But if the peptides come from foreign invader proteins, then the T cells get activated to attack the invader cell with weapons to eliminate it. The T cells secrete certain proteins and chemicals called cytokines and factors. These molecules punch holes into the cells that contain the invading organisms. Proteins are your body's basic building blocks. They allow your cells to divide, rest, and function properly. But sometimes these proteins get changed or mutated. For example, smoking leads to mutations that make abnormal proteins in our lung cells. Sometimes when these proteins are changed, they stop functioning normally. This makes the cell become cancerous by making it grow and divide to become cancer. These mutated proteins are also broken down into smaller pieces and are presented as peptides on the surface of the cancer cell. 
These abnormal peptides are recognized by the TCR as foreign and activate the T cells to kill the cancer cells. But if the immune system can recognize and eliminate cancer, then why do people develop cancer? Sometimes the immune system fails to do its job. The immune response against cancer may not be strong enough or cancer cells may evade the immune system. Tumors or a group of cancer cells can build a defense network against our immune system. These defense mechanisms can either prevent the immune army from entering the tumor or can weaken and inhibit the T cells. For example, tumors can express attack molecules on their surface that bind to the T cells and inhibit their killing activity. These molecules are called checkpoints and examples are PD-1 and CTLA-4. The tumor can also secrete proteins, factors and cytokines that inhibit T cells from attacking and killing cancer cells and can also turn the T cells into friends of the tumor. These cells can then deactivate other T cells. These traitor T cells are called T regulatory cells and are the enemy of the killer T cell army. The field of immunotherapy has shown great progress toward a cure for cancer after working at it for many years with some major recent breakthroughs. Immunotherapy is actually one of the most important revolutions in the history of medicine. What are the different types of immunotherapy? Immunotherapy functions in two primary ways, by enhancing the immune system and making them stronger, and by using drugs that help inhibit the suppressive immune environment of the tumors. One enhancement method is to create vaccines. Foreign antigens can be identified by identifying mutated proteins in the tumor. These mutated proteins, called neoantigens, can be given as a cancer vaccine. The cancer vaccine is developed to activate the patient's own T cells against the foreign antigens. Like the flu vaccine fights against the viruses, the tumor vaccine fights against the foreign tumor cells. Now that the T cells are trained by the neoantigen vaccine, they go around the body to find those specific mutated antigens and will locate them on the tumors. Another enhancement approach is adoptive T cell transfer, where T cells are taken out of the patient's body, grown in the laboratory, and educated to recognize cancer or even modified to become much stronger. These fighter cells are then transferred back into the patient. A third enhancement approach is using stimulating factors called cytokines. Cytokines are stimulating proteins like interleukin 2, 7, 12, and 15 that cause the T cells to significantly multiply and get stronger. A fourth enhancement approach uses agonist antibodies such as anti-OX40, anti-GITR, and anti-41BB and others to cause the T cells to grow and strengthen. This allows the enhanced T cell to overwhelm the cancer cells. A second approach to immunotherapy. Strategies have been developed to knock down cancer defense mechanisms. There are antibodies that neutralize the inhibitory factors and cytokines, such as anti-IL-10 and anti-TGF beta and IDO inhibitors. Some of these approaches have already been approved by the FDA, like anti-PD-1, and anti-CTLA-4. For example, patients in this clinical trial have melanoma, a kind of skin cancer. 50% of people with advanced melanoma die in 12 months until recently. Patients were treated with antibodies against both CTLA-4 and PD-1. Growth of the melanoma tumor in different patients was recorded and plotted out in a graph. The growth lines show that targeting both CTLA-4 and PD-1 encourages T cells to fight cancer. With this combination approach, 70% of patients with advanced melanoma continue to survive more than three years. These therapies also have some side effects that need to be monitored very closely by the treating physician. Although the side effects are not very common, they could be life-threatening if not treated. These side effects are treatable, especially if discovered early which include diarrhea because of inflammation in the intestine, include some endocrine diseases that lead to weakness, thyroid dysfunction, or diabetes, and other side effects that need to be discussed with the treating team. The future of immunotherapy is in combining different approaches to accomplish two goals, to create a trained army of cells to attack the cancer, and to break down the defenses of these cancers, 
by unleashing your own immune defense against cancer to improve on the currently very impressive results that immunotherapy is already providing our patients. Dr. Alasa, you're on mute. Oh, gosh. Treatments like surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy. Okay, sorry for that. All the cancer cells without taking into account their environment. They okay. can be toxic to the surrounding cells. For example... Can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Going back to a 20-year-old theory, researchers have started okay. to investigate so Dr. Patel, can you, can you the close the video? System ...to fight back yeah. against cancer cells. Uh. The main theories behind the concept of immune therapy are called immunosurveillance. Can you close the video? I know. They rely on Where's proven immunological... Okay, so let me, let me do this. Let me do this. 1957 by McFarland Burnett and Lewis I Thomas, will, who proposed will... that lymphocytes act as sentinels mm -hmm. in recognizing and... Okay, great. Beautiful. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Great. So, so basically, we will see that uh, the, the current mainstream medicine, they're using antibodies to enhance the T cells to block the, um, the, the inhibitory um, ligands of the T cells. There's the, in the T cells, there's uh, a paddle a uh, gas paddle and a brake paddle. Um, those are two co, we call them co-stimulator, co-inhibitor ligands. Um, and so, so we have the, we have antibodies that helps to block the brakes. And when you block the brakes, you allow the T cells to be active and kill the cancer. So we will see that one of those brakes, when the tumor which express the PDL1, react with PDL of the T cells, and that will stop the T cells, cytotoxic T cells from attacking the cancer and inhibit them. So if you have antibodies that block that, which is one of them is Optivo, then we can enhance T cells to kill, the cytotoxic T cell to kill the cancer. The problem with giving those antibodies, yes, it will enhance the cytotoxic T cells to kill the cancer, by blocking those brakes, paddles of the T cells, but it will also trigger autoimmune diseases. It will cause uh, uh, ulcerative colitis. It can lead to uh, uh, diabetes. It can lead to thyroid problems. It can trigger all those autoimmune diseases and your body start attacking your own self antigen. So that's where the mainstream medicine have a problem with immunotherapy. Um, so we solve this problem by taking those antibodies and wrap them inside nanoparticles. And then those nanoparticles will carry it to the pathology, not going everywhere. That will get you the, the structure of the cancer without triggering the autoimmune disease. So that's what Dr. Patel does with her patients right now. She is using nanoparticle, nanotechnology, to load those cancer drugs, to load those photosensitizers, to load those repurposing drugs that will polarize the immune system into TH1, M1, to load those antibodies all together into nanoparticles and get them into that K 
cancer in a state of going everywhere, preventing those chemotherapy, those photosensitizers, those antibodies from damaging your health, the healthy tissue. And that's how we combine the nanotechnology with the uh, immunotherapy. And that's why Dr. Patel, she will be experienced outcomes better than the oncologist, the mainstream medicine or completely following the big pharma protocols with no questioning. Uh, uh, of course, that will benefit and profit uh, the big pharma. And of course, most of the treatment of cancer is, most of them are monotherapy. They're not combining everything together and managing the microenvironments of the tumor, doing personalized medicine, looking for all those, um, you, you know, all those weakest point of the cancer, whether they're going to be sensitive to the optiva or not, you have to check, you have to do genetic testing, finding out if the tumor is expressing PDL1 if the tumor is expressing into leukin 10, all of that now genetically, we can know the behavior of the cancer, uh, whether they are secreting those immune suppressor cytokines, you can know it in advance and then start blocking them. You can create antibodies that will block into leukin 10, transforming growth factor, PDL1, uh, CTL4, and, and you can manage it in a personalized way versus the big pharma are choosing certain things that you can do and of course, that is not going to help in managing cancer. So I will let Dr. Um, Patel to share her slides and cases so we can better understand all this new concept in action, in cases. And Dr. Patel will be explaining all, the, all this information that we learned today in a case scenario. I think that will be easy to be encoded. So go ahead, Dr. Patel, can you share your cases? Okay, you, you can see my slide, right? Um, I don't know, let me see. How about now? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. So what I'm going to discuss is the case for the breast cancer um, in a female. Uh, this is a 56 years old white female who was diagnosed to have adenocarcinoma of right breast. She was asymptomatic, but this was a routine mammogram. And this was done in, uh, just a minute, a mammogram in 2019. So she also had a previous mammogram, which was considered negative. However, it also had suspicious lesions. So she was asked to have another mammogram in a year, which she did, and it showed um, uh, adenocarcinoma of right breast. Now look at her system review that she has a history of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She was very active in thyroperoxidase antibody, which was 900, thyroglobulin antibody 569. She was also hypothyroid and she became hypothyroid after the birth of her son at age 21. So her pregnancy was a great precipitator for the autoimmune process. Then in 2014, this patient started having certain issues like weight gain, which was 45 pounds. She was had a history of chronic fatigue, joint pains, neck pain, back pain, sleep apnea, insomnia, anxiety, high blood pressure, uh, hearing loss. And then subsequently, she developed also the tremors in her left hand and then gradually lost the movement, flexible movement of the uh, regular flexion extension movement of her left hand and it became more spastic flexion position. The CT scan of her spine showed that she had no impeachment. And following that, she had also a nerve conduction study, which confirmed and diagnosed the no impingement too. So her family history, positive for autoimmune disease, and her mother had a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And she died not because of CLL, but she died because of the complication of chemo. And she has a brother who is alcoholic. So uh, 
However, she is not alcoholic. The environmental history was very significant that the walls in her house had black mold and, and she cleaned it herself with chemicals. What? She no, and, then, and then she painted it afterwards. He's all done. He was trying to see if there was a way to fix that. Hello? Following this, she developed the chemical sensitivity. And, and currently, she still had her basement, which was damp and musty. So the, I advised her to get the mold evaluation. The mold evaluation of her house and the basement showed a heavy growth of aspergillus and penicillium, as well as altern area mold. And so she was recommended to have a mold remediation. So she got the mold remediation. Now, then her, once her mammogram was positive for multiple nodules, her right breast had a needle biopsy and it showed invasive ductal carcinoma. So then they did the onco test, which were, had a very high score of 37 and showing the poor prognosis as a higher incidence of distant metastatic disease. So she, uh, he has a high... Uh... She had an MRI, which was positive, and PET scan showed a local disease. Uh, she did not have any other metastatic lesions. So she was suggested to have surgery. Initially, she was told that she will get the total mastectomy of her right breast. Then subsequently, the surgeon changed the mind and he did the triple lumpectomy instead of total mastectomy. And also he removed sentinel lymph node and along with that, he removed other four or five other lymph nodes and they all were negative for cancer. And subsequently she was recommended to have chemo as it was a stage two disease and invasive ductal CA and higher oncoscope. But she declined to go for chemo and radiation because that was the main reason her mother died, not from her disease, but from the complication of her treatment. So subsequently, then she looked for the integrative oncology treatment uh, center and she came to HC Buffalo, that's uh, our center for integrative oncology treatment. And following the baseline blood test, she was provided 16 weeks of oxidative therapy along with the photodynamic therapy. And the, in my last lecture, I did uh, discuss about how the photodynamic therapy works. So I'm not going to go much in detail, but if anyone has a question, I'll be glad to discuss at the discussion session. Then she was gone uh, for a while. She felt good and most of her coexisting symptoms were gone. She continued to take her supplements, including vitamin D, and she was also placed on low-dose naltrexone. Follow-up, uh, she did not come until after she had her another PET scan, which was about uh, six months later. And uh, her one year anniversary was in December. So at that time she had a PET scan done which showed the right axillary enlarged lymph node. And then on January 22nd, she had a ultrasound guided biopsy which was positive for metastatic adenocarcinoma of breast and size of the lymph node was about 21 millimeter. So at this time, she, she was recommended to have the total axillary lymph node resection. However, she did not follow this conventional treatment um, because her left extremity was completely non-functional. She was not able to do any use of her left upper extremity. And right 
um, hand and right up arm was her main functioning unit. So she did not want to uh, go for the surgery for the simple sake that they explained to her that there are certain side effects and the complications can occur and she may not be able to use her right extremity as good as she did before the surgery. So then she decided um, to come back and she returned to our center again. Uh, we reviewed all her medical data, and then we ordered some tests. And so the biomarkers of inflammations were very high. As Dr. Halarsa said, uh, discussed that TGF beta, which is the driver for the TH17, which, which does drive the tumor growth. And she also had a D-dimer, which was very high. And as you know, um, the tumor, also gives out the coagulate, uh, promotes the coagulating factors, and one develops the um, high coagulation parameters. And she had also immune dysregulation. And so we decided to do some further testing to give her the precise treatment. So we ordered the cancer screening at the RGCC uh, test which uh, for the circulating tumor cells to find out the sensitivity uh, for the drugs, uh, chemo drugs, including the immunotherapy drugs, wanted to know the genetic markers and mutations. And we also wanted to know if she had a multiple drug resistance, because if she had a multiple drug resistance, then we had to uh, take uh, different route of treatment and include uh, that. So in her treatment program, we, after receiving the RGCC pro, uh, testing results, we did the treatment program. While waiting for the treatment, uh, the test result, we started her on repurpose match and we started her on a metformin, berberin, tetracycline and so on. Uh, and we gave her the oxidative therapy. We gave the oxygen ozone treatment, high dose vitamin C with insulin potentiation. So in our hands, we have found that plainly giving the vitamin C alone uh, was not as effective as the insulin potentiation. And also we gave her the intravenous methylene blue photosensitizing agent along with the high uh, uh, energy uh, photodynamic therapy. We also did the ultrasound exam. Uh, we repeated that. So this was the first ultrasound exam diagnosed that she had enlarged lymph node and that lymph node was biopsy positive and was 21 millimeter in size. This one was the second ultrasound, which showed the lymph node size remained the same, but was more localized and there were no other new and large lymph nodes. So, so subsequently, on the same day, we injected her with the uh, exosomes, matrix exosomes and methylene blue. And three weeks later, she was unable to palpate this node and we continued the oxidative treatment. So exosomes were very effective. Then we got the RGCC test and it showed the multiple drug resistance. She was not sensitive to immunotherapy for which she did not receive PD-1, monoclonal antibody treatment. And then uh, she was sensitive to doxorubicin and, and cisplatin and uh, carboplatin. Then she received again the ultrasound guided injection, but at this time we changed the course. We gave her the platelet lysate and nanoparticle treatment and uh, in her axillary lymph node. And these nanoparticles included the platelet-derived nanoparticles 
uh, including the platelet membranes, which is mixed with the peptide TA1. Now remember that TA1, as Dr. Halarsa pointed out, that, that results into the polarization of the TH1, and which are very essential for the uh, autophagy for the uh, cancer tumor cells. And so we use that as an immunomodulator, which increases the tumor apoptosis as well as autophagy. And then we gave her the methylene blue, which is a photosensitizing agent. Uh, and, and because we were going to give her also the PDT treatment, and uh, we gave her the Avastin, which is an anti vega factor. And Dr. Halasa did discuss that, that it, it is very important to um, manipulate the micro environment of the tumor and, and uh, the produce the hypoxia. So if you, if you give these, then it works, and it is anti angiogenesis factor and it will also destroy the blood vessels which are there, leaky and, and uh, uh, provides the great degree of hypoxia locally following the injection. So after that treatment, we, we followed her with the photodynamic treatment by giving her the low level laser light of 660 uh, nanometer and uh, had a higher frequency of and photon energy. And simultaneously, we also did the shock wave therapy because the shock wave therapy, the sonication, it provides the sonication and it does the vasodilatation due to the release of nitric oxide. Also, it stimulates the mechanotransduction releases the substance P and which controls the pain following the therapy. It increases the cell wall permeability, stimulation of the stem cells, which increases the apoptosis and autophagy. These stem cells uh, are uh, in the surrounding tissue. So it is very important that uh, we, 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 we treat the site of injection in around the area and shock waves are transmitted in the site of tumor and surrounding tumor microenvironment. Uh, tip of this shock wave transmitter transfers the energy to the tissue that receives the photodynamic treatment. And it, it uh, also uh, loosens up the tumor tissue. So the autophagy becomes easier. Now, this slide shows how the shockwave treatment works. The shockwave penetration, as you see that here in O, oh, there is a scar tissue and it breaks the scar tissue, it shatters and breaks it apart. And then the light can also penetrate much better. Also, the medication that we injected will spread it uh, in the tumor uh, and not limiting the perfusion. And uh, as you see that the effectiveness of the shockwave, acoustic wave treatment, it, it can be used in um, a tumor cell therapy as well as in a regeneration. And all what we have to do is do the low energy use. Another um, important thing is do not use shockwave therapy all these treatment have to be performed simultaneously. You cannot do one at a time. And if you, if you break the tumor, then it will spread and increases the metastasis. So it is very important that we don't do that. So then following this treatment, patient has done well. All biomarkers of inflammation has improved. The TGF beta one pretreatment was 24,000. And the post-treatment, um, two weeks later, it came down to 7,300. So biomarkers of cancer breast are negative. All biomarkers, 
Her lymph node size has improved and reduced in size. She has continued with the oxidative therapies and follow-up exam in four weeks, which is going to be this Thursday. She will receive her second treatment. And we are just doing that more uh, as a, as a follow-up treatment because uh, we don't want to deceive ourselves that she is cured because we cannot feel the uh, lymph node and we cannot see the lymph node because e even if there are few cancer cells are left, we know that with the matter of time, they will, they will proliferate and that proliferation can be enormous in nature. So uh, we are, this time we are going to add a chemo in her uh, treatment. So whatever is there, we will kill, destroy the DNA. And hopefully that, 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 is, that may be the last treatment or a few months later, we may repeat another treatment. So now this, uh, in order to summarize, how does this platelet, uh, the nanoparticle treatment helps in cancer. The membrane coating from the platelet lysate, and these membranes are the platelet membranes, which provides a means of enhancing interaction with the tumor microenvironment. Dr. Halasa mentioned about the tumor microenvironment is very important and that, uh, it has to be changed in order to control the tumor growth and in order for any treatment for the cancer to be effective. And so, uh, and the activity of the drugs injected. The intratumoral administration of platelet nanoparticles uh, are used also for the drug delivery system as it enhances the local immune activation and it leads to complete tumor regression while providing protection against the repeated tumor re-challenges. So that's very important because as he mentioned that, that uh, some of these cancer, adult cancer cells uh, has a tendency to become the cancer stem cells and you do not want um, uh, the cells to go through that route. So it, it helps this targeted therapy, which is very specific systemic therapy. It, it helps the patient. Moreover, the treatment of an aggressive breast cancer, intratumoral PNP, drug peptide, delays the tumor growth and inhibits the lung metastasis, locally delivering the immunostimulatory loads using biomimetic nanocarriers, which possess advantages such as enhanced biocompatibility and natural targeting affinities. So it is, it's important that whenever you want to do the uh, drug delivery, this is the best drug delivery system you can have. Um, when there are, and the amount of the drug which you have to use is is one tenth of a dose of a regular dose, uh, similar to what when one gives into the insulin potentiated treatment. But uh, insulin potentiated treatment, uh, you cannot do much of a local delivery and treatment like, like in this patient. And, and complications are much more. So this is one of the best treatment you can have for localized cancer along with the photodynamic therapy. So now we are open for discussion. That was a wonderful lecture. Um, I do appreciate all the information and I think it's wonderful information and, and medical movement. But as we talked about at the beginning about patients being sickly, their pH, their acidic nature. Um, I also believe that there's a concern for nutritional value here, uh, alkalize the body. I see that you do. Um, yes, we did the, all of that. We did, okay. we, did, we did the, whatever, that's why I say that repurposed drugs. It, it's the first thing, 
we do is the environmental history. Okay. Then we do the we do their medication history. Then we do their diet history, and we make all these modification before we start any treatment. Because the first treatment is their environment in the air they breathe, the water they drink, and the food they eat. So if their environment is polluted, there's the extra load, and we don't know what is the initiating factor because you know the tumor does not grow so the all the we have to clean up their matrix because anytime when the matrix is not good then the then all most of the chemicals and the pollutants are sequestered either in the cell or the matrix but the initial route is the matrix so you have to you have to uh, pay much more attention to matrix and that's why the clean water is very important because the water is what conveys the energy and the flow of the energy and the electromagnetic field of the cell. So when electromagnetic field of the cell is interrupted, that was the beginning of the illness. When we are not able to see physically, but the, there was a functional impairment. So it is very important that you do that then you do their environmental history, you look for what chemical exposures they have, because as we know what hormonal exposures you have, as you see that when she was 21 years old, she developed already autoimmune disease. Uh, just after the pregnancy is a big storm for the auto development of our autoimmune disease, but we have a natural factors that prevents that. But uh, so you are right, we have to alkalinization of the tissue, the pH of the tissue, the nutrients of the tissue. And uh, th that's very important that we have a good amount of antioxidant to start with. And, uh, and then, then when how to survive the cancer repurpose comes in, in later on, but for, for prevention purposes, that's very important. So once our cancer is, is, is in remission and we will do again uh, in a few more months, uh, another PET scan, make sure she is clean. And then we are going to start her. She is already on a detoxification program. She's already on the sauna treatment. She's uh, on the detox uh, nutrients. So uh, what I today presented was that I wanted to highlight what other treatment we can do besides the, I did not um, discuss about the normal integrative part, naturopathic way of treatment, but I, I wanted to make more presentation of the localized uh, treatment and how we can use and modulate our immune system through use of the peptide drug delivery along with the photosensitizing agent. And then we did add uh, a few other things in it. So so that's that's how we have handled, but you're right. The Thank pH you, doctor. must be, the diet must be, diet must be clean, diet must be, the water must be at least the the clean water, which is the, uh, we, we say that usually uh, the spring water, glass bottle spring water, get rid of all the plastics, uh, do not use the microwave oven. So those, those are the basic uh, for anybody who is sick and anybody who does not want to be sick, th these are the very prime um, principle that one should use in how to remain, uh, how to remain healthy in a safe environment. And that is the basis of the environmental medicine and which is my primary speciality. And this integrative oncology, uh, regenerative medicine and uh, chronic disease management it is my, my another complementary medicine. Even the patient should be, should be checked for the toxic metals. And if they have a toxic metals, you know they are not going to clean up um, their environment, micro environment. So we have to treat them for that too. So it is a, it's important because anything what destroys the normal cell and makes them deceased, uh, all these factors have to be removed.
Dr. Bill, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm, the, I'm here. Okay, you're the boss, man. I Don't thought you were that. the boss. Okay. All right, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Halasa, Dr. Uh, Patel. Um, anybody else have any other questions, um, comments? Um, anybody have anything to add? Going once, going twice. Okay, uh, next week, Dr. Uh, Crowley and myself will be presenting a couple of case uh, studies um, that uh, we, we found interesting and I think that the group would find, um, uh, we're gonna hopefully make it, a, to make it an interactive uh, um, session so that we could uh, you know, get discussion as, long, as we go along um, to um, sort of facilitate things. I know my, my case uh, turned out to be a complete surprise, so I wanna bring it to the group. Um, I don't have anything new to add along the lines of our um, transition to integrative medicine from um, uh, rheumatic diseases um, this week. Um, we're still uh, working with the AOA to um, uh, uh, facilitate um, making the, these um, webinars CME credits. Um, it's going to be a little while yet. Um, July 27th to 31st in Las Vegas, we will be presenting with uh, the Nevada Osteopathic Medical Association at the Sun Coast. If anybody's interested in going to Las Vegas in July, where it's 114 at midnight, um, let me know and I'll get you some information on that. Um, and um, Dr. Uh, Burgess isn't here this week. Um, but we're beginning to, like I said last week, we're get, getting our own med. For those of you who don't know, it's the uh, AOA's uh, scientific convention. There's usually anywhere from three to 5,000 doctors at these um, gatherings. It'll be in Phoenix uh, this year. I think it's October, um, I think it's October 18th to the 21st. Um, and um, anybody's interested in, 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 in helping us uh, present our case, um, please uh, let us know. Um, Dr. Patel, thank you so much for your um, efforts. There is a question for Dr. Patel in the text. Can you can you read it, please? And the question yeah. is, just says, thank you, Dr. Patel. How long do you apply the environmental low detox treatment before the PNP cancer treatment is applied? Well, the, it's, it is we use the detox treatment as an ad, adjunct treatment. So we, we, when patient comes and when we order the test, so it's a between three to six weeks. Okay. Okay. Dr. Patel, do you um, utilize any of the genetic tests like Dr. Forsyth does here? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the RGCC test has a lot of genetic testing in it as a part of the whole, we, we, we order the very extensive profile. So that gives us uh, not only the genetic profile, but also it gives us that which genetic profile is associated with the, with the abnormality and uh, what, what are the other consequences of that. Some are very high and some are low. So it gives us that profile too. So it, it's very, I think it is very helpful um, to see the drug testing, genetic profile. And what I found that there is a, they also give you the profile for the heat shock proteins. And if the heat shock proteins are, are not, if they are abnormal, then, then we, we use commonly the sauna treatment for our patients for one of the detox uh, treatment, but the heat shock protein and hyperthermia uh, also are interrelated. So if the heat shock protein is abnormal, sometimes hyperthermia treatment doesn't work. We can continue the sauna treatment. However, we can continue the sauna treatment for the detoxification. So one must not confuse between the hyperthermia uh, treatment for the cancer versus the sauna 
hyper treat, hyperthermia treatment for the detoxification. Because one is for the tumor involution and the other one is for the detoxification. Another question if, is which biomarkers in genetic testing are you using to see test efficient, efficiency? There are, there are not, oh, one, there are, there are three biomarkers we are using. Um, it is CA 15.3. I, I don't remember. I have, I have a profile written it down and, and I, I use uh, that. So there are, there are, there are three biomarkers we use. Okay. Um, if you're um, willing to share, I, I can put it up on our website, um, you know, um, with, uh, you know, the, our webinar um, uh, material, if that's okay, you could send it to me, you know, okay, sure. another time. Yeah. Okay. Anybody, um, hyperthermia treatment during uh, th treatment is what? I, Question is... I, Hyperthermia treatment is, is used for eradication of tumor too. So uh, in, in my practice, we use the um, hyperthermia treatment when we are, we are giving the uh, photodynamic treatment. Our photodynamic uh, uh, treatment machine has also hyperthermia along with that. So there are some units which are dual units, which gives the hyperthermia while providing. So if you increase the tissue temperature, if, if the heat shock proteins are favorable, then, then it helps in involution of the tumor, increases the autophagy, mitophagy, and uh, apoptosis. Okay. What temperature are you getting to? We have, we have not measured it. It's, it's supposed to be, uh, we have not measured it, but it was supposed to be much higher and, and we can, we have to keep some distance between the skin and the machine, otherwise patient would get the burns. Okay. Uh, we don't have that kind of probe and we cannot put, put the uh, directly under it. Um, but when when I check with that guy, uh, the the scientist that who who made the machine, he, he said that it is it is in a hyperthermia range, which is which is a much higher, uh, but it is not as high as the hyperthermia unit they use for cancer. When when we use photodynamic therapy, uh, we use methylene blue or endocyanine green, and when you shine the light you would have photodynamic effect, which is generation of the free radicals that induce apoptosis, but also those methylene blue, when it absorbs the red light and the ICG, when it probes them for red, it heats up. So you get that thermodynamic effect. You got my point? So there's thermodynamic, photodynamic at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, and hyperthermia, you can do that. It will be a triple positive. Yes, but I, well, I guess I was getting to the fact that like in Germany, they're saying that the cancer cells are not being deactivated or destroyed until you get to 106 degree temperature. So it's pretty high. So what they're saying is they need to put their patients to sleep and actually increase their body temperatures up to 106 before the cancer can actually be burned or deactivated. Right, so but we are not using we are not using the the hyperthermia alone as a treatment. Okay, okay. We are using the hyperthermia alone with the treatment. You, if you remember, we are using like Dr. Halasha said that we are using the photodynamic therapy. The main nemesis of the photodynamic therapy is you give the photosensitizing agent, and photosensitizing agent one works for the the more superficial layer for the red light and the deeper layers for the ICG. And once that uh, uh, photosensitizing agent meets the, meets the photons from the lights, it, it generates the large amount of singlet oxygen. And the singlet oxygen is the one that destroys. It's, it's a very, very powerful radical. 
and and during that uh, it it also generates the heat so like dr halasa said that we are we are doing the photodynamic therapy with the uh, thermogenesis and then if you have a hyperthermia it it, it is a uh, also increases the temperature but if you have a tumor tumor localized just in abdomen if you can put the light right on the abdomen it is going to go not more than 106 degree thank you yeah but but the thermodynamic effect of uh, icg and methylene blue is more effective than just hyperthermia just no, the microwave right. itself it's you can increase the temperature, but you're not as you're doing it with photosensitizers because those photosensitizers, they will absorb the light, generate the heat inside the cells and, and blow up the whole cells, which is more way more heat than, um, than, than just uh, doing the microwave thing. And not only that, but, but it, is, it, is, it occurs right in mitochondria. So when mitochondria of the cell is gone, it, it, it itself cannot survive. It's a mitophagy, autophagy, apoptosis. Thank you. Welcome. Hey, Dr. Patel, thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank Dr. You. Halasa, of course, our uh, leader here. Um, anybody uh, have any other questions? Um, Dr. Kinnis, do you have any comments about, I know uh, um, Shockwave was mentioned. Do you have any, anything to add if you're there? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, getting uh, the topic of Shockwave uh, here on the board. And uh, I mean, uh, we just uh, came back from a BioLife uh, meeting in Boston and Shockwave is uh, really a great uh, tool. It's this primarily used more and more and uh, kinasmedical.com is our website and we will be happy uh, to answer any questions just look at our website see uh, how we can be of assistance and let us know thank you so much and I, since it's getting late I don't want to take much more well, of your well time. let me let me add something very important the only shock wave that works very well is the one that Gerhard has because there's two type of shock wave, the superficial one, which is good for regenerative therapies. But if you want to do cancer, you need to have the deep one that goes deep inside the tissue. And uh, that's called sonodynamic therapy. So Dr. Patel was doing photodynamic, thermodynamic and sonodynamic therapy. That picture that you saw with the laser, that's, that's photo, thermo, and when she did the shock wave, that's sonodynamic therapy. Those shock wave do generate free radicals. It causes the re a reaction of the oxygens and generate free radicals. The same thing like the, uh, uh, the photodynamic therapy does, and that's how we kill the cancer. Uh, but something you may consider it if you want to move forward in integrative oncology. Um, I think you need to have both photodynamic, uh, thermodynamic. <laughs> and uh, sonodynamic therapy. I 100% agree, Dr. Halasa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Any, anybody else? I wanna thank, we, I see a couple of new names tonight. Uh, Dr. McCulloch, this looks like a new name. And uh, Joe Ballage, I know you've been with some of our, our main conferences. Um, and, uh, Anybody else is Marie Fogarty, I know is a friend of Dr. Um, Burgess. So thank you all for, Sam Patel also, brand new. Thank you all for um, joining us. If you have any um, any uh, information you'd like to share with us, please let us know. Um, we're here. I have nobody on my Thursday this week and I'm traveling a lot. Is there any way, Gerhard, you can go ahead and take over Thursday and present your shockwave? Gerard, are you there? Okay, he left. I'm I'm here, yes, but unfortunately, actually, on my, I'm traveling too. I'm on the road uh, uh, to Florida, to Orlando, to a meeting. Okay. So I would love to take the opportunity, but 
unfortunately, it's not uh, possible. That's fine. We we'll do it next week. Then, then, hey, Doctor William, can you return the favor and present on Thursday? I can present something. I don't know if I'll be ready for what I have next week, but I can always, you know, I could always have something in my toolbox. Yeah, anyway. have a many things. Come on. <laughs> you never presented my conference yet. And I present on your conference. You guys, are, you, got, you guys are too, you guys are a lot smarter than me. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I feel like I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm in kindergarten. Yeah, that's, that's called humbling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's called love for five is trying to do. Okay. So Thursday, can we take yes? Yeah, I'll do so. I'll, I'll take it. I'll talk to you about what you want. Okay. Uh, you're the best. Thank you. Okay, anytime. Right, you, you're the you. We got we got to support Dr. Halasa here. You know, he, he does yeoman's work <laughs> for for uh, a lot of groups. So, okay, so I am going to say good night to everybody. Thank you so much for um, your uh, participation, Dr. Halasa, Dr. Patel. Thank you um, for another a great lecture. Uh, we are recording this. It will be on our website. Uh, probably it usually takes us about 48 hours to get it up there. Um, if you have um, transform cells. If you have um, the slides, Dr. Patel, that you would like to share with us, I know that they're on, they're on the video, they'll be on the video. And Dr. Halasa, we can put those up also. Uh, to find it, it's aosrd.org slash webinars. I'm going to put it down here. Dr. Yeah. William, we are not, I, I tried to go on that, but they ask for details and I don't have those details. They, to they sign, in. What? sign in. Uh, oh, the to, sign in, the, the one, the only one, the only one for the sign is, is under presentations. And that was for our conference in March because that was, you know, it was a paid conference. So I, ha I have the, um, I have usually we'll, we leave that um, as a sign in for about a year, but there's another column there right next to it called webinars. And if you go there, you can get a, a lot of the webinars that we've done, um, you know, uh, on the Tuesday nights. And if you go under presentations, except for the last one where it says uh, Congress of Medical Excellence 3.0, all the other ones, you can click on them and you can get the slideshows for, for them for the last couple of years also. Okay. So Thank the you. Other one the only one that's that's um, password protected is is our last one that was a, a paid one, and that's only fair to our um, you know, our, our paid participants. Um, but AOSRD.org uh, slash webinars, and you, you'll, you'll, all the webinars are there. Um, if you go to the present past presentations, except for the last one, it's password protected. If, if you're part, we're part of the group, uh, the paid group, you can get in there. Let me know if you don't if you need the. Uh, the, um, the, the uh, uh, password. And usually, like I said, about we usually leave it for about a year of um, password protected, and then we'll open it up when it's time for the next one. So um, and again, thank you, everybody. Let me know if you're interested in presenting anything in Las Vegas at the end of July. And um, anybody who uh, who's here who wants to give a presentation on a Tuesday night, please let me know. Um, next week, like I said, Dr. Crowley and myself will be presenting some case histories. Um, I guess I'm going to be doing something Thursday night also um, for Dr. Halasa. And um, uh, next month, we have Dr. Pam Smith, who those of you who are in the um, A4M anti-aging uh, program know um, she is like the, uh, she's the head, the head, uh, 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 she's the head of it. She runs the whole thing. She started it. She's the, she's the, one of the main teachers and she's a terrific uh, speaker and we're, we're lucky to have her. If you have anybody else you'd like, um, like to recommend to present to us, please let us, again, let us know. Um, and um, with that, um, I can say, I'm gonna say good night to everybody. Doc, thank you, Dr. Gerhardt. Dr. Beck, I'll get you next week if you're here. And uh, uh, anybody else that's, um, um, you know, wishes to present anything, again, please let me know. If there are topics you want, let me know, and we'll, um, we'll take it from there. So I'm going to say good night, and thank you all.